Wow, everybody, it's been far too long since I've been here, here at Pamplin Historical Park. I just love coming here. It's been more than a year. Um, and this is also, you know, the perfect place to sort of, you know, cap Grant's attempts to finally break through, you know, the Confederate line. You might recall we were at Union Fort Welsh before. Well, that's about, I don't know the distance, but let me say, 1,803 yards um, off in the distance through those thin trees there. In other words, the open ground beyond Pamplin Historical Park, which is about to those trees there, becomes um, American Battlefield Trust land and then National Park Service land beyond, and that's where Fort Welch is. You'll recall that on April 2nd, 1865, uh, there is plans for a dawn attack. Will Green already talked about setting up the troops in and around Fort Welch, laying in front of it. Imagine the moment before this attack started, okay? And then there it's going to start. And to talk more about this, let's bring on our friend Tim Talbot. Um, he's the director, head of education, and a whole lot of other things <laughs> here at Pamplin Historical Park, especially during COVID. Thanks for joining us, Tim. What do you got to say? Sure. So as you mentioned, these guys are laying in formation and how they got into their position is, first of all, the Union artillery and the Union forts across the way, about one mile, are going to bombard this position for almost three hours the night before the night of April 1st into the morning of April 2nd. So from about 10 p.m. until about 1 a.m. on April 2nd, they're gonna send all kinds of shot, shell, everything they can over here to soften up this position. But as we all know, earthworks do a really good job of not being destroyed very easily. So it's probably doing more psychological damage to these Confederate defenders who probably know that something's coming, but there's nobody behind them to give them reinforcements. That gets those Union soldiers into position. They're gonna be attacking in a wedge-shaped formation with three divisions. General George Washington Getty's division in the center, General Frank Wheaton's division on the right, and Truman Seymour's division on the Union left, about 14,000 men in those three divisions. 42 regiments, they've been ordered to load and um, bayonet the rifles, but not to cap them. They don't want them stopping to fire and then all of a sudden breaking formation. This is supposed to be a sledgehammer blow into these Confederate earthworks. Pointing, uh, pushing these Confederate defenders out at the point of the bayonet. And as they're attacking across this field with uh, Getty's division right in the center, it's being led by the Vermont Brigade, who is being commanded originally by Lewis Addison Grant. But during the um, pre-attack, he actually takes a spit bullet to the head and he has to actually uh, turn over command of the Vermont Brigade. But they continue forward, following this ravine over my left shoulder, right into the Confederate earthworks, where there's sort of a swampy area and no earthworks, and that's gonna be their avenue of attack. And as they're going forward, leading the Vermont Brigade is the 5th Vermont, and leading the 5th Vermont is Company H, and leading Company H is Captain Charles Gould, a 19-year-old captain. He's gonna be turning 20 in May, the next month. And as he's leading his men forward, he apparently hears someone behind him say, bear left, bear left. And he and his men actually break off and follow another ravine that's been created in the geography here that uh, weeds them through the earthworks, or excuse me, the obstacles, the abati, and they make their way up toward the Confederate earthworks. Captain Gould knows the safest place is in that ditch where the Confederate defenders cannot shoot him without uh, exposing themselves. He gets into the ditch and then realizes, I better lead by example. He scurries up that wall by himself standing on top of the earthworks, motioning his men to follow him on, and a Confederate soldier who's behind the earthworks sees him in the pre-dawn light, raises his rifle, points right at his chest, pulls the trigger, but fortunately for Captain Gould, the gun goes click. He jumps down into the earthworks, and is immediately a target from all these Confederate soldiers. One Confederate soldier runs over with his bayonet, lunges up and catches Captain Gould right in the chin, and the bayonet goes through his chin and out the other side of his face. Somehow, probably with the adrenaline pumping, he's able to pull that bayonet away from his face, use his sword on that soldier, but a Confederate officer runs over with his sword and hits Captain Gould right across the top of the head. Again, I think Captain Gould had a little fortune shining on him, he either hit on the flat side or that sword was not sharpened because it doesn't cut through his cap or his scalp. But he said it's like getting hit on the head with a club. And then finally, he looks over the earthworks to see where all of his men are. <laughs> and he gets pulled back into the earthworks by other Confederate soldiers and bayoneted in the upper back for his third wound. He's gonna be eventually re rescued when all of his troops start surging over the wall and Corporal Henry Recor is going to pull him over to the other side of the works, make their way back to the Union lines, and then he's gonna receive some serious care at City Point and eventually receive the Medal of Honor. Good, that's it. Don't go anywhere, Tim. So uh, what we have here is a famous story, right? And I've been lucky enough sometimes to see some of Gould's actual items here at Pamplin Historical Park. But, you know, 
like in all battles, right? There's 10 different people that claim to be the first ones over the work. So what, what's your take on this? Is Gould really first? And if not, who's else competing for this? Yes, I think he's got a good claim to it since the Vermont Brigade is at the center of this attack and they're at the point of this spear um, formation. So I think he's probably got the best claim to it. There are others, but of course this is at what? Uh, 440, 445, 4 50 in the morning. It's dark, it's hard to see. They're attacking on a mile wide front. So it's hard to see who actually made it uh, out of those 14,000 soldiers first over the earthworks. Another good claim uh, at the other end is John Buffington of the 6th Maryland Infantry uh, who received a Medal of Honor. There's actually 36 soldiers who received the Medal of Honor in the 6th Corps here for fighting on April 2nd. Well, and that makes sense too, right? This is what I like to call the most consequential assault of the entire Civil War. Okay, show me another assault, assault that results directly in the fall of the Confederate capital. I don't think there is one, okay? And it starts right here. And I do wanna ask you um, a little bit more. So so they break through, okay? The thin Confederate line starts to fall back. In, in a nutshell, what then? So a lot of the Confederates flee back toward Petersburg uh, some of them head back toward the South Side Railroad. Uh, what the Union Army is going to do is after they break through here is kind of get themselves reorganized. And instead of turning toward Petersburg immediately, they're going to actually turn and follow the earthwork line all the way down to Hatcher's Run. And they're going to clear out and make sure that they don't get attacked from the flank or behind. And then later in the day, they're going to move back up with the 24th Corps here to this position and then on into Petersburg. The 24th Corps is going to encounter Fort Gregg and the 6th Corps is going to encounter artillery placed around Lee's headquarters at Edge Hill. And good, let's not talk too much about Fort Gregg because unconfirmed reports might suggest we might head over there <laughs> and it's got a cool story and a very interesting one indeed. So in the end, we have this huge assault that happens here. And man, we told you this on the other side, Fort Gregg, uh, Un I'm sorry, Union Fort Welsh is over there. You can park in the American Battlefield Trust parking lot there. You can walk along the National Park Service line of works that we showed you on the previous video. You can then follow the walking trail across the trust land and eventually you'll come to some signs that you're entering Pamplin Historical Park. Don't enter. That is unless you want to complete that walk and come all the way up here the way the Vermonters and the other more than 10,000 soldiers of the 6th Corps come. But if you do come and do that, you'll walk through Pamplin Park and please proceed to the main visitor area so you can pay your admission. It's well worth it. And I think we'll talk about that on another video. Tim, anything else to add? Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming here to help tell our story, and we do encourage people to come see us. Please do. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to Tim and all of Pamplin Historical Park for having us, and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.